to you about intelligence preparation of the cyber environment. Here we go. So, as uh, Rebecca pointed out, um, actually a soldier, not an officer, but yes, British Army military intelligence. Some of you may have uh, remembered my talk from last year. Not much has really changed. The two things that really have changed since last year for me is I got myself an avatar and um, <laughs> I've been promoted. So, uh, I'm the Director of Intelligence and also now the CEO of a company called Security Alliance. Um, I'm also a CREST Certified Threat Intelligence Manager, which uh, in some parts of the world, in order to create threat assessments for parts of critical infrastructure, not only does your organization have to be certified to do so, but so do the, uh, the people that do it. So I'm one of those people, mostly working on things like CBEST engagements and threat landscape work. Um, two particular areas of interest, insider threat and nation state fusion warfare. So really how are information operations, intelligence operations, conventional warfare, cyber warfare, how are all of those glorious things coming together and what's conflict gonna look like in the future? Um, as well as all that, I'm also uh, an associate director for uh, Gartner for Cyber Threat Intelligence for the EMEA consultancy, uh, consultancy team. Um, and as I said, I'm from a, a military intelligence background. And that's really why I'm here wanting to talk to you about what IPB is and what intelligence preparation of the cyber environment is, because it's kind of my old school craft. It's what I'm doing now, but I've just kind of taken it into the cyber environment. So. This was me last year, and what I want to do this year is I just want to progress uh, from where I was. So last year, I talked about conventional intelligence methodologies and how we are adapting those into to cyber. I talked about wonderful things such as murder boarding, uh, devil's advocate, uh, tenth man, uh, all these things that we do to check, what we're, check our work. I talked about cones of plausibility and how we can take our scenarios look for variables and work out what potentially is going to be happening in the future, and also some of those you know, wildcard things that are happening as well. I talked about backcasting, so that's effectively going, this is where all my really cool stuff is, and this is what people want to get from me. These are my crown jewels and my key assets. This is where the threat actors are, so what's the stuff that happens in, in the middle? How are we going to work that out? Um, and then, towards the end, I had about two minutes on this. I said, why are we doing all of these things? Why are we using all these methods? Well, what we're trying to do is reach intelligence preparation of the battlefield. Um, and this is the definition that I gave at the time, and I'll just go into it in a little bit more detail in two seconds. But effectively, what I was saying was IPB. Now, there is intelligence preparation of the battle space, as well as intelligence preparation of the battlefield, and intelligence preparation of the environment. All slightly different things, but I'll come on to that in a second. But what is IPB? It's effectively the stuff, right? Define the battlefield environment. Where's my employees? Where is my supply chain? Where are all my assets? What's in it? Where are all of the things? What are the things that affect them? Uh, Rick mentioned it this morning. I talked about it last year with PESLEM, STEM calls, some of those subheadings that help us determine those things. Evaluate the threat. Who are they? Who are the bad guys? Uh, why they're coming after me, what they're after, how they're going to do it, and what are those attacks actually going to look like? What are the courses of, uh, courses of action, which to you and me are, you know, what are the threat scenarios? So that's what IPB was. It was trying to get some form of 360 degree understanding of what was happening within my environment. Now, last year I was telling you all how I was a bit of a weirdo and everything is in notebooks. I, uh, I work in cyber, but I don't like computers. Um, Effectively, I've regressed a little bit. I don't have my notebook so much. I just draw on the wall behind my desk um, and stick things to it. So this is my research around intelligence preparation of the cyber environment. So what I really want to cover today is just some definitions around the differences between battle space, battlefield environment, and actually what a cyber environment is. I just want to also pull out some of those techniques that I talked about last year and show you where we could potentially use those within the methodology of IPB. Talk about the stages, that's the important stuff, isn't it? How are we doing this within cyber? Um, and why? What, what can we do with IPC? Why are we doing it? What's the fallout for it? And what we should be doing with it in the future? And then just share the three main references. Uh, there's a lot of references that I use for the research, but there's three particular uh, cases that are really strong. So, intelligence preparation of the battlefield. This is the, the definition. The definition comes from the good old US Army and the US Marine Corps. 
Uh, I dropped the British one from last year, but we don't really want to know about IPB. We want to know about intelligence preparation of the cyber environment. Now, bad news. There is no definition for intelligence preparation of the cyber environment, so I made one up. Uh, I stole stuff from other people and other places. Um, and really, this slide should probably have me in a, a turtleneck jumper on a, a dark background uh, with this definition next to it and the name and date. But effectively, this is what I've come up with. IPCE, intelligence preparation of the cyber environment, is a systematic and continuous process of analyzing the means and motives of threat actors, your digital environment, and the digital environment in which you operate. In order to understand the likely scenarios in which you will face threat, enhancing, hopefully enhancing your operational resiliency. That's what I see IPCE as. Again, like I said, I made it up. So there's somebody out there who's much better at this and will probably make a better definition. Um, there's some fallouts from that, why I've included certain things. Old IP, I've included continuous. IPCE is something that we're just doing. Chances are, most of you are doing IPCE anyway, but I've just put a name on it and stolen it from myself um, and make money out of you. That's what I do on my vendor. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so some other key points. Carnegie Mellon University. I think they borrowed this from uh, the Naval uh, War College, actually. So the, the key to success in defining the virtual environment is to an, uh, analyze it from an adversarial point of view. Absolutely key, and I have a slide on that in a moment, so we're going to park that and I'll come back to it. Why we're doing it? Well, US CERT kind of sums up the ability to organization to achieve its mission even when you're a bit under attack. And effectively, SANS. Thank you very much. It, IPB, needs to be part of rehearsal, simulation, and testing and development now. I'm going to pull this one out into a specific slide in a moment as well, because again, that's really important. I promised, so from last year, kind of those methodologies and where we can use them. Um, when we are talking about scenarios, and I'm talking about looking at it from an adversarial point of view, red team SWAT. So that's less um, what are my strengths and weaknesses. That's the enemy going, right, what are my strengths, strengths when I'm going to be uh, targeting Rob Darnell? What opportunities is Rob giving me in order to attack him? Uh, what weaknesses have I got? How potentially can I be uh, determined? Um, cones of plausibility when you're looking at your scenarios. We know what these scenarios look like, but let's look at some of those drivers and those assumptions that we've made and change them and see how those scenarios could change and then also include those in our playbooks. And scenario generation, and my favorite, I love backcasting, you know, working out what's happened. But what's important, horizon scanning for me, um, quite often, these exercises and what we do with IPCE is like a single point in time exercise. What we need to go, do is go, what's changing in the future? What's out there that's going to have an influence on me? What's my organization going to be like in a year, two years' time? What's my technology? What's my strategy? How's that going to involve? And therefore, how's my landscape going to change? If you can get there, good for you. Most people can't. So IPB then, still not quite on IPCE. Sorry, we'll get there eventually. These are the four stages primarily. So three main areas of research. Carnegie Mellon Software Engineering Institute, uh, they wrote a paper on operational resiliency. The US Army, Military Doctrine, and the SANS Institute. Now you can see that they're all fairly similar, they're not too dissimilar, but effectively step one, I love the terminology of the SEI, determine the voice of the environment. That's very 2018, isn't it? Uh, define the operational environment, define the battlefield, right? So all of the things. Step two, determine the voice of the organization, which is fine, but there's also external voices that have an influence. So for me, it's more along the lines of SANS, define the effects on the battlefield effectively. Step three, determine the voice of the threat actor, because threat actors have voices and opinions and emotions as well. <laughs> and evaluate the threat, all right? And step four, describe use cases. Now, for me, use cases are really important to help drive your courses of action, but they are different. But really, step four, what are those courses of action going to be? But that's IPB, IPCE. So people that know me know that I, um, I really like simple, plain English especially intelligence. The secret to intelligence is really strong dissemination. And we all know in our industry, we're really bad at verbalizing things. We're very bad at disseminating our intelligence and making it appealing to the board and other people within our organization. So I put things in layman's terms all the time. It's actually mostly because I'm dyslexic and I can't understand words with more than three syllables, but it's fine. 
So what does it really mean? What are we looking at? Operational environment, what's affecting the operational environment, who are the bad guys, and how are they coming out of me? So know yourself, know the bad guys, know what different compromises look like, and know all of the things that are going to influence the bad guys in my environment. It's pretty simple, right? Probably mostly doing it. Because effectively, where we're trying to go is uh, situational awareness. Now, situational awareness is a glorious thing that you will never achieve. It is something you aspire to get, but you'll never quite get there because the environment is constantly changing. But effectively, I think this is a really great uh, definition, the perception of the elements in the environment within a volume of time and space, uh, the comprehension of their meaning, and the projection of the status into the near future. Uh, OK, that's fine. Um, but basically, perception of the uh, everything within my environment, understanding what's happening with them and around them, and projection of what that's going to play out in the future. That's effectively what we're aiming for with situational awareness. Now, as I said, for me, this is really important. The key to success in analyzing the environment is to assess it from the enemy perspective. Forget about IPCE for a minute. Think about you as analysts. You should be finding yourselves in this mindset most of the time. It's great what you understand your environment to be and what you perceive the threats to be and what you perceive to be critical data, but the enemy is going to have a pretty different opinion about that. Uh, their mindset's slightly different, and they're going to look at things differently. Uh, given their situations, they may be interested in something slightly different to what you were uh, predominantly expecting. So we always need to think about it from a red team point of view. But it's not just that. There's somebody else as well. There's three pers perspectives. There's my perspective. There's the enemy's perspective. And then there's the business. There's neutral forces. There's other employees. There's my clients. There's customers. There's always three perspectives to everything. And you need to always look at it from, from those three different perspectives in order to really have a good understand of, understanding of the environment. Right, we're getting there, I promise. Let's get into it. Determinant of the operation environment. That's where we are on step one of IPCE. Now, you're going to see some mind maps. Um, these are not exhaustive. This mind map is this big. It should be this big. They are there to give you some starting points and some ideas. Determining your operational environment, big, tough gig, right? Uh, try and break it down into two areas. Your environment, what you control, your IT architecture, your network diagrams, your physical, tangible things that you've got, your servers, your racks, your firewalls, all of these things, the, the software and the applications that they're built on, the operating systems, all of the vulnerabilities that are attached to them. Where is your data and your information when it's in transit? Where is it when it's being processed? Uh, this is your operational environment. And this is not an easy task. I, I will argue with anyone that tells me that they know their operational environment 100% of the time and where their data is all of the time. Um, but then you need to look at it from an external point of view. Where's all of that data outside of my environment? What are my employees leaking on their profiles? What's my, where's my data within my supply chain? Where's my data within my supply chain's supply chain? What cloud services? What uh, shadow services are my employees using on things like Dropbox? Where are they leaking code on code repositories? Like, uh, Well, there's loads of them. That's what you've got to try and find. I mean, hands up, who here has ever done full recon on their own organization from an enemy's point of view to see what can be used to target you? Who does that regularly? Awesome. It's a really fun exercise, and I know a lot of vendors do that for you. But that's what effectively you're trying to do. You're trying to be the enemy and find all of those things that could be used against you. Credentials that are being leaked as part of breaches. Documents that can be weaponized, that are sensitive, that can be fed back into your organization. Step two, we know all of the things. But what affects those things? Now, before I move into this, this can sometimes be a bit of a difficult exercise. Um, I remember when I first started my uh, army military intelligence training, um, a bit into it, I started doing strategic, or I had a strategic intelligence role. And you had to put, put your head into a position where you were trying to perceive things that you didn't really have a big grasp on. And I was quite young at the time, and it was quite difficult for me to understand what geopolitics in Southeast Asia were affecting the role that I was doing based in London. There seemed to be you know, a disconnect, but there's always a connect. Um, we talked about stemples and PESL-M. 
Uh, in reading my US military doctrine for this presentation, I came across a new one. Pemaziputi, uh, not very cool. I think uh, legal is missing, so it should probably be Pemaziputi. Um, I'd probably stick with PESLM or STEMPLES personally. But these are the subheadings that can give you a starting point to try and think about the effects on your environment, right? So again, this mind map should be 10 times the size it is. It's just an idea and some starting points. What politics, national, geo, uh, geopolitics, are affecting my environment? Now, there's a caveat to this. Everyone in this room comes from a different organization, right? Some of your organizations are hundreds. Some of them are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. You may operate in the US. You may operate in 128 different countries. You might operate in oil and gas, pharma. You may work in government, whatever. Some of these influences will be completely different. For, or in fact, all of them will be completely different for every single one of you. So President Trump doesn't sign off on the current uh, restrictions against Iran. What effect is that going to have on you, on your organization, and your data, and your information? Um, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with North Korea, actually enter into a military conflict. Um, Brexit, for me, being a Brit, in a couple of years, we're either going to be swimming in the cash, or we're going to be broke as anything, right? Uh, how's that going to affect my organization? How much budget am I going to have in the future, or am I not going to have, probably not going to have? Um, climate change exists, people. So uh, how many people are going to be working from home because the office is being flooded or, or whatever, opening up parts of your network that you've never had to open up before? That's all great. That's effects on the outside. But those effects, effects uh, have uh, occur on the inside as well. What's my internal politics like? What's the board's appetite toward, towards cyber and information assurance? What's the business strategy? Are we going digital? Are we bringing everything back in-house? Uh, are we outsourcing everything? Are we trying to make as much cash as we possibly can to float? So I've got no IT spend. I've got no security spend. Um, these are all things that have a physical, tangible effect on your environment. Step three, determining the badness. Ultimately, you want to know who, what, where, when, how, why. But how do you answer that? Some of you probably have a really good idea. You've got use cases from your internal SOCs. You're part of ISACs. You've got use cases from uh, similar organizations. You've got a pretty good grasp of it. But what happens if you haven't and you don't know? You're brand new to your CTI team, or your CTI team is, in fact, brand new. It's an exciting place to be. I'm quite jealous, actually. OCGs. You can start big, right? This is just a financial services institution, uh, very generic. Start by categories. You don't have to start going, APG 28, it's the Russians, it's the Russians, it's the Russians. It's always the Russians. Um, it can just be, I'm a financial services organization. Organized crime groups are going to be interested in me. Insiders have got access to a lot of trading data. Nation states, because I operate in 50 countries, are interested in dissident data based on the massive amounts of PII that I have. You can start that big, and that is perfectly fine. I personally use a capability and intent score, so uh, times capability and intent, capability being a score of one to five, intent being a score to one to five. It starts giving me a direction to start looking for particular actors. Once I know that organized crime groups are interested in me, I can probably start pulling those use cases and going, okay, FIN6, FIN7, Carbon Act. These are the organized crime groups. These are their capabilities. This is their intent towards my organization. And I can start to have a bit of a, a better idea of who are those organizations, sorry, who are those threat actors coming at me. What do you want to collect on those threat actors? Uh, depends on how much resource you've got. Uh, depends how much time you've got. This is just what I collect. Uh, this is just a screenshot from our threat match platform. But it's kind of, who are they? What's their use cases? What's their intent? What's their motives? Um, what are their TTPs at each aspect, or sorry, each element of the, the cyber kill chain? Who are they associated with? What are they likely to be doing in the future? What languages do they speak? Um, all that kind of stuff is really good information to collect on the people that are targeting you. Oh, malware. That's pretty helpful to know what, as well what malware and tool sets they're using. Kind of fundamental, really. But what about the scenarios? Right, we discussed this earlier. There's two sets of scenarios, right? There's the most likeliest scenarios, the ones that we're probably going to see or are seeing, and then there's the most dangerous scenarios, those ones that are less likely but really high impact and, worst case, 
uh, scenarios for us. We need to document all of them and show our working. Your scenarios can just be really generic and a sentence long. OCGX is going to target my cash management system in order to steal cash. Pretty simple, right? We can start with our capability. We know now we're talking about FIN7, so we can give them a capability score of four. We know what they're after because they've previously attacked that payment system. I've got that payment system intent high. I'm a big profile bank, threat scores. Um, I put opportunity and impact at the bottom. Uh, impact is really important to start assessing from this point of view. What's the so what? What's the fallout for the business? Because remember, you're trying to tell a story to the business, right? It's not just about what's the impact to me as a, as a cybersecurity professional or in the SOC. It's what's the impact to the business. Opportunity is harder to gauge at this point. Opportunity will come when you actually start to rehearse and simulate some of these attacks, but I'll go into that in a second. And like I said, back from 2017, uh, timeline analysis, but backcasting is really cool for this. This is the payment system that they're going to go after. This is where they are right now. What have they got to do in order to get to that system? What am I going to see? What are the combat indicators? What are the flags that are going to crop up? When I see these things, I can start to attribute attack to somebody or identify a particular type of attack. How you do your scenarios doesn't really matter. Um, Personally, I like to tell stories, not in that kind of sense. <laughs> I, um, what I mean is I like to write a story about these attacks. You know, how does the, the, the story start? Why are they doing it? What are they going to do? What are we going to see? And then most importantly, what's the denouement? What's the fallout for the organization? Um, because not everyone's technical. Not everyone's in a sock. These stories work really well for the board when they start reading this story and it starts feeling real for them as if it's actually happening. You can attach it to some form of kill chain um, or a variation thereof. You may just care, how are these guys getting into my organization? How are they going to move through it? And what are they after and how are they going to get out? It can be as simple as that. Like I said, it doesn't really matter. It's about what works for you, but most importantly, what works for the audience that you're trying to tell the story to around the threat actors. So where are we? Potentially somewhere near situational awareness. I kind of got a perception now of all the elements. I've spent six months trying to find all the data in my organization. Um, I've got a comprehension of the current situation. I know who's targeting me. I know what's going to affect those types of attacks. And I've got an idea of how these attacks are going to actually play out. Bit of a caveat, there's kind of three levels of maturity here. Maturity one, perception, reporting on what you think before you've actually completed your uh, intelligence methodologies until you've done some murder boarding, until you've run some devil's advocate against all of this. It's a pretty dangerous place to be. If you think you know what threat actor might be coming at you and you think what assets they might be going after, therefore you've put in a particular set of defenses, but you don't really know, it's going to be expensive and dangerous. Just doing everything I've described documenting it, having intelligence methodologies around it, that's a fantastic place to be. If you've achieved that, good for you. And then horizon scanning, like I was saying, it's about looking into the future. Where's my organization going? Sorry, that's the third time I've done that. You'd think I'd learn by now, wouldn't you? <laughs> um, where's my organization going? Are we moving into a new territory? Are we launching a new product? Are we building out our IT architecture in a particular way? Um, all of these things, what's going to happen to the threat environment over the next one, three, or five years? Really important place to be, aspirational, absolutely. Um, to appease those that uh, uh, will say, but Rob, there's a difference between battle space, battlefield, and uh, environment, you need to break this down. If you operate in multiple geographies and multiple areas, you need to do IPCE for each of those. If you operate in different industry verticals, you need to do IPC for each of those verticals. The threats you face in North America are very different to the threats that will face you against your payment systems in Thailand or Australia or South Africa or definitely South America. So you need to break that down. You can still pull those together for an operational-wide uh, operational view of the environment, but having individual pictures is critical. You can really go down into quite minute details for those. But why? What's the point? Sans says it best as ever, absolutely. It needs to be part of rehearsals, simulation, testing, and development now. The funny thing is, now was in 2001 when Sans first wrote this paper. 
So uh, yeah, 16 years ago. Now I can do math, quick math. Um, there's some really good government and regulatory uh, environments where effectively, they call it other things, but it's IPCE. They're only a couple of years old. Um, why do we need to do it? We need to take those attack scenarios and you need to find your favorite red team. You know, those red teams that are highly certified, very expensive, you've previously seen their CVs and their previous reports, so they are good red teams. They don't, not just pen testers that say they do red teams. And you need to get them to test out those scenarios. Once they've tested out those scenarios, you're driving your brilliance of your blue team because the red team is going to sit with your blue team and show you what they did. And they're going to work together. And they're going to enhance their capability for instant response as well because they're constantly practicing. It's going to create your playbooks, you know, your use cases, and they're going to get better and they're going to play into the SOC. Um, it's going to drive your policy and hone your policy and actually make it more effective. Most importantly, when you're doing this stuff, it's going to help drive your strategy a bit better, but you're going to find some real good tactical and operational wins that's going to drive your roadmap in a direction that's probably less expensive, less time consuming, and effort is pushed into the right areas. But most importantly, from an intelligence point of view, your ITP, your intelligence collection plan, is driven by IPCE. You know now where your intelligence gaps are. You know you don't know where's my data. You're not 100% sure on particular threat actors or current methodologies. You know, don't really understand what the business is doing. You haven't really integrated into HR procurement or business strategy or to the board to find out what's their aspirational place to be. All of these gaps will be come out of your uh, IPCE and help drive your intelligence requirements and help drive your intelligence collection plan. So really good place to be. And like I said, most of you are probably doing a form of IPC already. I've just put a name to it, which has actually been around for about 50 years, but hey. Uh, questions. <laughs> so I just want to say, those are the three main resources. Uh, the SANS paper is fantastic. Uh, the US Army and US Marine Corps uh, doctrine is very good, very in-depth, but it's 212 pages long. As I said, I'm dyslexic. I won't read that much, so the SANS paper is best. Carnegie Mellon, uh, they're mostly focused around operational resiliency but that's effectively why we're doing it. So though, therefore, that's why I put it up there, is a, is a good resource. Thank you all oh, very much indeed. <laughs>